Pathways to Revolution. And uh, I'm really thrilled and honored to bring everyone together here. Uh, I'll introduce the panelists in a minute. Uh, before I do, uh, and I just want to talk about two things. Theater for me is an art of metaphors and an art of using space, and I love the metaphor of the space we're in right now. Uh, uh, an, an a, a lobby, an atrium, an open space, a fluid space, uh, a democratic space, an accessible space. And I think that metaphor of this space is probably relevant for the work that all the folks on the panel do here in their theater in terms of accessibility, uh, openness, and uh, challenging uh, what how we make our work accessible. Uh, I also am thinking about the amazing uh, training that Carmen Morgan led yesterday at Art Equity, uh, all along with Lydia Garcia. And what was very powerful for me in that training was about questioning, questioning language. And that's what dramaturgs do, that's what we as theater artists do with the written word. We interrogate language, we question language, we question structures of power, we question the questioners. And I was very thankful for that. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, and again, that might be something that people on the panel deal with in terms of how are their theaters questioning the kind of plays we do, the kind of stories we're telling, how we connect to community, how we're thinking about power and structure. So thank you. Um, the theaters that we've uh, gathered represent a quite an array and a diversity of theaters across the field. We have theaters from urban areas, from uh, rural areas, uh, theaters that have been around for 50 years, theater, the theaters that are quite new, theaters that are more connected to the academy and university, theaters that are more uh, connected to quote unquote professional um, actors and, and uh, uh, people on, on um, the production team. But it is really, uh, for me, a whole series of theaters that are challenging challenging the issues that are related to the panel about access and activism. And so I thank you for joining us today. I'm going to read you their bios right now. So we're going to go uh, from uh, my right uh, to my left. Amy Brooks is the program director and dramaturg for Roadside Theater, the theater wing of Appalachian Grassroots Arts and Media Center Apple Shop. She coordinates the company's core programmatic areas of new play creation community cultural development, teaching, and advocacy. Amy is the former Humanities Director of the Contemporary American Theater Festival in Shepherdson, West Virginia, a co-founder of the Twitter-based discussion forum, Rural Arts Weekly, and a recipient of the 2016 LMDA Residency Program Award, a grant that allowed her to initiate her career with Roadside Theater. Sonia Fernandez is a scholar, translator, and dramaturg specializing in new work. Recent production dramaturgy projects include the world premiere of Grandeur by Han Ung at Magic Theater and the shipment by Young Jin Lee with Crowded Fire, where she's a longtime company member. Sonia is the Associate Artistic Director at Magic Theater, where she manages casting in the literary department and produces the Magic's annual Virgin Play Festival, featuring workshops and readings of a dozen new plays in development every December. A PhD candidate at UC San Diego, Sonia's research focuses on audience experience of racial humor. She received an AB from Princeton and a master's from San Francisco State. Thomas Friedland he received his BFA and MA degree in theater from the University of Colorado and his PhD in drama from Stanford. He has worked in theater all his life, acting, writing plays, and directing, as well as translating. He has taught acting, voice, theater history, and dramatic literature at Stanford. American Conservatory Theater, Oberlin College, and the University of Colorado. He has been a lecturer in Stanford's oral communications program since 2000. He has appeared in numerous Stanford repertory productions over the years, including Betrayed, The Exception, and The Rule, Words to End All Wars, and Democratically Speaking. He will appear later this summer in the Stanford Repertory Theater production of Anton Chekhov's The Proposal. And S.K. Karastas is a social justice-driven theater artist, educator, organizer, and current artistic pro producer at the California Shakespeare Theater, Cal Shakes. They're, they are a co-founder of Hashtag Breaking the Bi Binary, a series of arts programming and EDI workshops for arts organizations with the goal of creating and supporting sustainable practices for trans inclusion and accessibility. 
in the past year, they have produced events and led programming at American Repertory Theater, Arts Emerson, APASO, Associated Performing Arts Service Organizations, and Woolly Mammoth Theater Company. Prior to that, they were a visiting artistic associate at Berkeley Rep through TCG's Leadership, Univers e Leadership U, one-on-one -on -one grant round two. SK served as the education director at About Face Theater in Chicago, where they directed and managed the queer and trans youth theater program and all outreach programs with an intersectional focus. They are an executive co-chair of the Pride Youth Theater Alliance and a member of the inaugural Art Equity Cohort. And I'm Jeff Janczewski, um, artistic director of California Repertory Company, uh, which is in Long Beach. I'm also chair of the theater arts department at Cal State Long Beach. So I've asked each of the panelists to talk about three things, and it might get a little bit fluid, it might change a bit, but it's essentially about presenting a portrait of each of their theaters, the incredible work that they're doing, the dynamic theater th that they're doing, uh, so that we can get a, a kind of detailed uh, portrait or portrayal of the work that each of the, their theaters d does. Then also talk about the community. What are the issues that are in, that are really raging, that are on fire right now in their communities and how is their theater addressing that? And then third, at the end, hopefully we'll get some time, to talk about provocations for the field. Bombs you want to throw out at the field. Um, and uh, you know, just piggybacking on what Ken was talking about earlier, this is a very outward focused conference. And the two things I uh, remember him saying, you know, what are the hard questions and what are the actions following up on those questions? So today is a, lot, a day about questions and action. Um, Amy, why don't you talk about Roadside? And uh, I'm thinking about Eve Ensler's quote, which I was inspired, I stole from her amazing quote uh, to create the title of this uh, panel. Theater can be a pathway to revolution. Now is the time to use it for refuge for the vulnerable, for telling stories of the invisible, for re resisting the tyrannical, for imagining the new story. And when I was hearing about Roadside Theater, I thought a lot about the uh, telling stories of the invisible, or at least invisible to the theatrical canon, so we can talk about that. Thank you. And uh, is everyone able to hear me? Okay. Um, when we talk about um, making the invisible visible, I'm very interested in this as a fifth generation West Virginian woman. Uh, and what happens when that visibility manifests itself in a way that is uh, threatening <laughs> to everything that we represent when we talk about cultural equity, which I think is a lot of the story of what happened with this last election, and I'd like to get into that at some point in this panel because I think it's something that probably we should address. Uh, my name is Amy Brooks. I'm the program director and dramaturg for Roadside Theater, which is the theater wing of Apple Shop, as Jeff mentioned. I prefer the pronouns she, her, and hers, and uh, I also want to disclose that I make around $30,000 a year, uh, which is far, far better than I've ever done in my life uh, as an Adults, you know, I've, I've averaged about $11,000 a year income, and I owe about $8,000, which is really good in America these days, I think. Um, and if the gender identifier uh, sounds like a, a deeply important marker of personal identity, that it behooves us to identify and address publicly, and the income thing sounds like, you know, sort of embarrassing tertiary information that makes us a little uncomfortable and we'd rather I not discuss. But I'm really glad that we're having this discussion today because um, at Roadside we're not really interested in uh, discussions of gender or race that don't stay intersectional with class. We are a class-based theater in a region that has a strong history of democratic labor organizing and our sensibility comes very directly from that. Uh, so we're best understood as part of our parent organization, Apple Shop, and I'm just going to give you the Reader's Digest version of that. Uh, Apple Shop was founded in 1969. It was part of Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty initiative, and the idea was that uh, film industry experts would come in and they would teach these Appalachian kids in eastern Kentucky and southwest Virginia how to use film equipment. And then they would leave and get, uh, you know, gainful employment in uh, the film and television industries. So like good contrarian Appalachian people, once they had those skills and that equipment, the, the young filmmaker said, well, you know what, I think we're going to stay here and make documentary films and tell stories 
about the way we're living in our homes and what's actually happening here. So that was in 1969, and today Apple Shop comprises a number of media initiatives. Roadside Theater, my project, and when we say project, we mean division. Uh, there is a community radio station, WMMT-FM, that does community affairs and uh, public affairs reporting. There is a record label, Gene Apple Recordings. There is uh, one of the largest Appalachian media archives in the region. And um, there is also the Appalachian Media Institute, which is a youth filmmaking program. So uh, uh, we collaborate directly with all of these projects within Apple Shop, but particularly one called the Letcher County Culture Hub which is a partnership and a growing partnership of um, local artisans, people in government, and community organizers using the power of arts, including theater, to drive economic development in our area. So if you're at all interested, I won't go too into that in this panel, but if you're interested in finding out more, I can tell you about uh, the incredible community organizers who are making the Letcher County Culture Hub happen. So Roadside began in 1975, um, and it is very much best understood as a child of Southern justice movements like uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the Free Southern Theater. And it began from its inception with uh, friendship with uh, John O'Neill and June Bug Productions, New Orleans-based artists, yeah. And um, they they said to John O'Neill, well, John, there are some, <laughs> some folks forming a theater company down in Whitesburg, Kentucky, so you better go check out and see what those people are doing. He said, oh, God. So we went down and uh, got to know our artistic director, Dudley Cock, and they got to talking, and uh, I think John kind of gave them a little bit of shit and <laughs> about what they were doing and said, well, you know, I think, uh, I think you need some more diverse voices in the, the forming of this, so just to keep it honest. So... Um, so that was the beginning of a long-standing friendship and relationship. Um, the basis of our methodology is the community story circle, and all of our play creation comes out of some version of the story circle, and uh, this involves getting together as diverse a group of the community, whatever community we're in as we can, um, putting people in a circle, and laying some ground rules that come very much out of a kind of a recovery sensibility, meaning no crosstalk. We go around the circle, and based on a prompt, uh, each person has, you know, generally, if we can, an unlimited amount of time to respond with a story that has a beginning, middle, and end, and characters, and avoids any kind of polemic opinion or judgment. And uh, it's an iterative process from that story circle we have the basis for play creation that usually the community participants uh, will help us create or a roadside playwright working closely with them will put those stories into a play that is then presented to the community. And um, after that, there will be another round of story circles during which the audience gives their feelings, memories, and impressions of what they've uh, seen in that play. And that information of those stories are then used to do new rounds and drafts of the play. And this is the way that we build our community residencies as well. Um, our programming areas are uh, new play creation, community cultural development, advocacy, and teaching in colleges and universities. So I hope that we'll return to, to the, the higher ed theme because we feel it's a very important one. I know that most of the people here have some connection to higher ed. So the rest, I want to pass the mic now so that everyone has time, and I hope to discover more about it sort of through conversation with everyone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I wanna, uh, there's a number of issues I want to tease out later, Amy, that you're talking about. I mean, wha what I find very inspiring about Roadside's work is the story circle element and the way that you are generating empathy uh, and listening, deep listening. Uh, something I know you were talking about as well, SK, when, when SK and I were speaking. So it's another theme I want to get back to. But um, again, let's just initially get a little bit of a portrait of what each person does. So you want to tell us about magic and possibly clouded fire, if I can tempt you into that as well. Hi, I'm Sonia Fernandez. I'm the Associate Artistic Director at Magic Theater. 
And I'm also a company member with Crowded Fire, so I may throw some of um, those experiences in, but I'm going to primarily focus on magic, where I'm a staff member and been involved in all, um, all of those artistic conversations. I can speak more fully. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, and so the portrait of magic. Magic, we just celebrated our 50th birthday, which is a miracle because it is a company that was founded on um, new work, and we think of ourselves as 100% risk. Um, and by that, we mean that our audiences don't go in knowing who this writer is. They didn't study them in school. They're all, um, they, the people that we produce are living and are in the room with us as much as possible. Um, and central to the mission of magic and also Crowded Fire is the representation of diverse voices. Um, in terms of uh, aesthetically, like we're always interested in writers that are trying to do new things with the tools of theater and work that needs to be in a room with other people and not on a screen. Um, and <coughs> so we have a, a, a long and varied track record <laughs> on that. Um, about some of our programs. Um, we have an edu uh, education program with Laney College in Oakland, um, and that's been going on for, I think, six or seven years, where we bring students um, from that community college and involve them in our uh, production process so that they can witness the professional workings of a theater. Um, and many of those students go on to be involved in various aspects of the organization. They work front of house, they have assistant directed, they've been cast in our show. So um, that's a really important part of how we um, engage on that level. Um, in terms of, so I'm gonna jump to the, mm -hmm. to, to the now, <laughs> uh, what we've been thinking about in the past year uh, is just digging down to do what we've already been doing in a deeper way. So how do we facilitate those conversations o about the work that we're already doing um, and give avenues to, for people to really engage in a rich way? Um, Crowded Fire uh, also has a, an emphasis on new plays and it has, so I'm, I'm struggling not to make comparisons. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, perhaps a, a, a stronger emphasis on community engagement, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, it Magic is in the marina, and so we, <laughs> we talk about like not really having much of a community. <laughs> um, any of you who have been there, it's on Fort Mason, which is a former military base, and you know, across the street is Safeway. So we are, um, we, we are branching out to the Tenderloin. We will be a part of a space on market in the wh whenever they break ground. Um, so we've also been making inroads, inroads with that community and trying to engage with them and offer them tickets to come to see our shows while we're at Magic. It's always a struggle to get people to come all the way to Magic. Um, yeah. Mm. There's a, um, one, one of the, oh, the oh, what's, each person is dropping bread crumbs of things I want to pick up on after we each have time to speak. Sonia, one of the things that you were mentioning when, when you and I were speaking, and you mentioned it again now, was the using the tools of theater going, you know, which is um, an old impulse, right? To make the theatrical, make the theater theatrical, make, to use the skills and tools that theater has as opposed to the uh, techniques of film or, or television. So that's something I want to talk about and have everyone maybe respond to afterwards is how can we in theater respond and what are the unique capacities and capabilities that theater has? And also the whole aspect of being in the room together with that the, again, the empathy and the connection that the live experience can bring together. Thomas? Good morning. Uh, my name is Tom Freeland. I am uh, a company member with the Stanford Repertory Theater, and my preferred pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, Stanford Repertory, <coughs> we are in our 19th season now. We were founded by uh, Professor Rush Rem in the Department of Theater and Performance Studies, 
it began as a summer only kind of you know, pretty modest operation putting on a couple of plays uh, in the summer session and has grown over the years and now we offer programming throughout the, the academic year and we combine uh, casting of undergraduate students at Stanford with local professional actors and the kind of material we work with have varied enormously over the years. It's mostly, shall we say, no longer living playwrights. Uh, not entirely, not entirely, but, but for the most part. Uh, for one thing, Professor Rem, our founder, is a professor of both theater studies and classics. So he has a, a deep and abiding interest in Greek antiquity and also Roman antiquity. So what we're doing is looking at that day's newspapers, what's going on in the country, in the world, what's on people's minds, and is there something in the classical dramatic repertory that resonates with that? Is there a way we can approach uh, a classical text that chimes with that and, and provokes discussion? As I was sitting here uh, listening, I, I got to thinking about um, a famous quote from uh, a great German Jewish literary critic in the 1930s, Walter Benjamin, talking about how revolution, in his opinion, he was a friend of Brecht's, so, you know, they talked it over a lot. Uh, Benjamin felt that revolution is driven not so much by the vision we might have of the liberated future generations to come, but rather we think of our oppressed ancestors. We think of the people who've already paid a price and what, can we, what do we owe them in terms of moving forward. And I think in some ways, in an academic setting, what we do with, with our repertory is looking at the past in that way and how does the past speak to the present and what possibilities that, does that open up for the future. So some of the things we've done over the years, um, well, for instance, uh, shortly after 9-11 with the uh, invasion of Afghanistan, we staged uh, Amy Freed's adaptation of Lysistrata. So works like that. Um, we also put together staged reading kinds of things, uh, literary collages. We did one last year right before the election called Democratically Speaking. It was a whole collection of ideas about democracy, pro and con. Had some very provocative, weird, interesting things from, from notorious opponents of democracy. Uh, Hitler checked in with us to, to, to let us know of his contempt for the popular will, or the way that the popular will could be manipulated. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. And definitely some from the Federalists, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we did one uh, two years ago to mark uh, the centenary, three years ago, I should say, to mark uh, the centenary of the onset of World War I. We did a collection of, of pieces from the writings of World War I, uh, Words to End All Wars. We did, uh, one of the few pieces we did that is of uh, contemporary origin, um, a few years ago, a play called Betrayed by George Packer, uh, you may have read some of his pieces in The New Yorker, he's a staff writer for New Yorker, about the translators who worked for the United States government and military during the Iraq war, the Iraqi translators, and how they were essentially abandoned by the US when the US started pulling out of Iraq and the dangers that they faced. And so with these, uh, these pieces and the casts we pulled together, the cast for Betrayed, we had people from, I think, six or seven different countries in the cast of that play. And we always have talkback sessions uh, and they're often um, moderated by professors from different programs around Stanford. One of our great advantages is we are clearly connected with and supported by the theater department at Stanford, but we also get support from political science and continuing studies and many other programs. Uh, so for example, the uh, production of Betrayed was also sponsored by the Center for Ethics in Society. They have year-long conversations. They'll pick a theme. Uh, that year was the ethics of war. And so we produced uh, Betrayed, Copenhagen, to talk about especially the role of scientists in wartime, uh, which is an issue around Stanford, absolutely, where people have a very technical orientation and academic orientation. And then for educational outreach, we are in an academic uh, setting, of course, so a lot of what we do cannot help but be educational outreach happening at a university. But then we also take it away from the university. We had a production of Brecht's Exception in the Rule a couple years ago, and we took that out to schools in East Palo Alto and West Palo Alto and senior centers and things like that, and had some amazing discussions with the, the, the high school kids who'd never heard of Bertolt Brecht, knew nothing about that. 
and some red diaper babies at the senior center who knew all about Bertolt Brecht and were very keenly interested in the issues being brought up in that. So that's um, your introduction to Stanford yeah. Repertory Theory. And again, uh, the, the I want to get back, as Amy was mentioning, to the whole role of higher ed, because uh, what the teaching that uh, Roadside does, the work that uh, Tom and Stanford Repertory Theater does, also at my theater, Cal Rep in Long Beach, uh, connected to an academic institution. So what is that role? How can we instigate change in higher ed? Something that uh, Martine, the uh, future president of LMDA, was talking about in the panel, the plenary early, earlier about um, how we can, um, you know, cr decolonize curriculum, how we can really create the agents for change in that setting. Uh, SK. Thank you. Oh my God, so ready for the combo. Um, <laughs> my name is SK. I use they them pronouns. I'm the artistic producer at Cal Shakes. I've been here for two months, so I'm still learning stuff. Uh, quick introduction, this company has been, you know, historically white Shakespeare company in Orinda, like the mountains of East Bay, right? With like a really fancy building. And a year and a half, I think maybe two years ago now, uh, changed leadership. We have a new artistic director, Eric Ting, a uh, Chinese American director, who's, who is a new works director, right? That choice was specifically made. Um, and I think before that, there, you know, with programs like Triangle Lab and whatnot, there had been sort of like a, a, a stark turn to, to kind of change the company culture and whatnot. Uh, I would say what brought me there was having um, queer and trans people of color on staff and having a person of color in leadership. Every step of my interview, I was like, what, I, what, is, what is the reasoning behind hiring a white person in this role um, for a company that is really looking to diversify? And we had a lot of really open conversations about that stuff and that indicate their, their logic was really clear. <laughs> And, um, and I heard it, and it was awesome to be able to talk about that stuff within such a, like, you know, the interview process being, like, so loaded with a power dynamic. Um, there's a really great opportunity to be, like, redefining classics um, or, like, sort of, like, uh, uh, using this frame as classic to lift up a lot of, like, non-white, non-European work. An example of that would be um, Eric's been involved with an adaptation of Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler for a long time. Classic work, right? Like that is some classic work that like we all um, can learn and benefit from. You know, so that would be an example. Um, and then in terms of our artistic engagement, you know, we, we are in process. There is like not a day where we are not talking about power <laughs> and privilege and identity like on staff. Um, but part of what we're trying to do, we also utilize the story circles, and that is because we have folks on staff who came from a community service background, right? That is like where that sort of healing and empowering practice comes from. So intense to hear you say that, that came from like AA healing circles, right? So it's like, ooh, where did that, like the, the idea of sitting in circle is inherently non-Western, right? And not like a white practice. We could just like riff on that for a minute. But so we do that, we do story circles with the productions um, of folks with lived experience of the issues that we're like trying to investigate. Those folks get paid for um, the emotional labor of like having those conversations and we try to staff the productions with folks who also have that same lived experience. So the conversation is already deeper and more than one person, more than just the dramaturg, you know, who, <laughs> like, anyone who's brought in as the token to help a situation or to, like, add their lived experience perspective is, like, set up to fail already, you know? It's, like, such a hard position to be in. Um, so, yeah, I want to talk about story circles, and I'll wrap this up really quick. We're also trying to really look at kind of the structure, you know, look at who's on staff and look at how the money that we receive is distributed. So our community partners, we are trying to also micro fund and trying to think about projects long term. So instead of, you know, deciding we want to do a play, attaching two artists to it, and then the year of production, attaching a 
community partner or reaching out um, in curating the season, thinking about who is a lead artist and what is the community partner we want to work with, reach out to them that way, and that way we can apply together for funding to co-design this project um, so that it's like really beneficial for both parties involved. An example of that is we're looking to do 1001, which is an adaptation of Arabian Nights with the Islamic Cultural Center and collect 1001 stories of Islamophobia to then filter into the play. Um, and this is a partner that we worked with with Othello last year, really exploring Islamophobia through um, kind of the Muslim identity of Othello in that play. I'm not saying all our plays are like that structure, but this is what we're working for, and we have some clear examples of, of, of moving in this direction, and it's hard and complicated, but it sort of gives a sense of, and we have a lot of barriers, um, like a you know historically white audience who are really attached to like their Shakespeare, you know? Like that's just honest, it's not even a sassy comment, it's just what it is, right? Folks are really comfortable with that material. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of where I'm from. Uh, I love what SK and Eric are doing at Cal Shakes. It, uh, recently, I'm, I'm thinking about the metaphor of theaters like a garden and how gardens are quite specific locally. You can, you, what you can grow here, you can't grow perhaps in another climate, another uh, soil. Uh, I live in Long Beach and uh, I'm, I'm having a garden and I'm realizing, oh, there's certain things that wither and so certain things that thrive. And I think what SK and Eric are doing at Cal Shakes is like you're really thinking about the garden of that theater and reinventing that garden. Um, you know, what is, is something I want to get back to with all the different panelists is, is uh, how do we, about the story circles, um, when, when you and I spoke, SK, you were mentioning about a table a communal table that um, that you're building, and about the microfunding. So again, how, as theaters, what are we cultivating in our garden? I want to go. I want to. What I want to do now is actually get back to certain themes, questions, issues that were raised with each person, and now anyone can comment on that. So uh, it could be a bit more of a fluid conversation. Uh, the first theme for me was a, was a series of questions. Um, how do you listen? How do you have empathy? And how do you be uncomfortable? Uh, it was raised when I was speaking with you, Amy, about the work that Roadside is doing, uh, working deeply with the community, connected deeply to the community, rooted in the community, and also engaging in conversations in that community that can be quite difficult at times from different sides of the pers of, of a, an issue, for example. So maybe if you could talk about that and if other people also want to jump in on that issue of listening, empathy, being uncomfortable. We're going to trade these back and forth. Right, so I'm sorry. Maybe you can get it working. There are two buttons. <laughs> yeah, so uh, just for a little context, uh, Apple Shop is located in Whitesburg, Kentucky, uh, in Letcher County, which is in the 5th Congressional District uh, of Eastern Kentucky in the coal fields of Central Appalachia. Uh, it's among the sickest and poorest congressional districts in the U.S. Um, people there have about twice the disability rate. They live on average 10 years less um, uh, average income is like radically, radically lower than even with our great American income inequality. It's, it's, it's incredibly low. Um, and I live in Southwest Virginia, which is over Pine Mountain, and it is in uh, Virginia's ninth congressional district, a district that in 1980, I think, swung about 78%. Uh, no, sorry, it, uh, it, it swung for Jimmy Carter over Ronald Reagan. So it was very, very blue at that time. Uh, and this election swung about 78% for Trump to give you an idea of uh, the sort of turnover of power and um, political momentum that's happened there, I would say, over the last 40 years. Um, so, yeah. Throw, throw the question back out at me again, so sorry. For uh, 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 when you and I were speaking, for example, you were talking about uh, 
story circles where you would have people from radically yeah. different perspectives. And how, as a theater artist, and as a are you encouraging listening, empathy, and being staying in that un uncomfortable state? So I'm, I'm interested in hearing uh, SK's version of the story circle and your methodology for that. Um, ours is, uh, again, I want to get to this idea of, of beginning in a place where we can, we can move past the polemical or the, the opinion. Um, so if you, if you have two people we might have in a story circle in our area, for instance, would be someone who is deeply invested in the coal industry, uh, maybe someone who is a foreman uh, in a coal site, which we still have, although obviously that rate is decreasing radically, and someone who is an environmentalist. Um, and you might have them in a story circle. Now, if you ask these people, what do you think is best for the future of Eastern Kentucky? Where should we be moving economically? And how do we get there? you're going to have a problem, <laughs> right? You're not going to have an equitable conversation, and you're going you're to uh, connect a circuit directly to a place that is unsafe for people, that is incredibly loaded emotionally, that uh, they are both stake direct stakeholders in the community, um, and uh, has been politicized and emotionally charged to the point where uh, within the community people tend to avoid that conversation because it is not safe. It is not a safe conversation to have. And the story circle creates a place where people can bypass the polemical and if you ask those same people, tell a story about a time when you were afraid for your family's future economically you're immediately going to connect to a place that is more empathic, and chances are very good that you're going to hear that pro-coal person uh, tell a story that the environmentalist can relate to and connect with. All right, so um, that's something that we do within our communities, and that's the methodology that we take outside of our communities. So, I mean, as I'd like to hear just the details, you know, of, of what your story circles look and feel like and how they work. I mean, I, l I worked with Story Circles at About Face Theater in Chicago, which was a youth theater for queer and trans youth, and that's how we would generate um, material from lived experience, and we would share and group share and pair share and perform them and then sort of, you know, put, put a play together through that. Um, the Story Circles at... Uh, Cal Shakes I, were specifically initiated by Lisa Evans, who is a non-binary artist and activist in, uh, in the Bay Area and just became the artistic director of Peacock Rebellion, which is a arts organization for trans people of color. That's just like, hello, local artists. If you don't know about this organization, you should. Um, and they brought in this idea of the circle from from community work, also from like queer service work. And the way we utilize it with, with plays, from what I understand, because I participated in one and learned about other ones, is that it is a closed combo for folks who identify with, have lived experience like with the issue that we're investigating. Um, they get paid to be there, they get food. It is like a bonding, empowering moment, right? So for example, with Othello, there was a story circle about his experiences with Islamophobia, right? And that's what folks talked about for an hour and a half. And the assistant director um, is on that show, uh, Denmo Ibrahim is Muslim, and so she was the one who led it, right? And it was definitely like a connected, like kind of insular conversation, a safe spot for folks to share experience. And then they took a break and after and closed that one out and then held another one where they invited Eric Tang, who was the director of that piece. And um, and the, uh, shoot, I'm blanking on his name, but the person who played Othello into the room to listen, to just listen, right? And like, the, you know, they had like said like, oh, here's a couple things that we're exploring um, that they wanted the facilitator to bring up. Uh, but because of that, they were able to, like, that play had such a, like, richness of, like, Muslim culture in it. I mean, it was a controversial play. It was, like, Eric's first play at Cal Shakes, and folks, like, were really upset that it wasn't a classic Shakespeare done in a classic way. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there was a lot of stuff in there that was, like, specifically, like, referencing Muslim culture and inhabiting it in a way that most folks like wouldn't get unless you had that lived experience. 
And then, you know, what happens with the process is like the folks who are invited and who participate in the story circle are then paid to come back to the theater and give feedback and kind of work work with the play and sort of, you know, it's it's I think a, a really beautiful way to create work that is uh, authentic and has like a community of people who've had buy-in to it as opposed to like a couple. Yeah, so it's definitely using story circles as a tool, right? It's like they are, they are valuable in and of themselves for healing connected spaces and also as a tool for a show. Sonia or Thomas about that, this whole question of publication about listening, uh, how do we in our work, in our theater, generate empathy, listening. How do we, um, both listening to what stories need to be told, roadside, connecting to stories that are not told in the, in the dominant narrative in theater, um, and uh, listening to the people um, that we're working with, and how we sit with those uncomfortable conversations. Yeah. Um, so what comes to mind for me is our current show is Grandeur by Han Ong, and it's about sort of the final period of the life of Gil Scott Heron, who we've discovered most people don't know about. Um, he is mo probably most famous for penning the, the poem song, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. Um, and this play has, has triggered some really hard conversations. and. You know, as a dramaturg, I'm like the master of the talkback. Um, so we've been doing talkbacks after every show. Um, and we've, we've, been, we've done this a couple times this season on shows that we felt uh, were asking for more than our regular Friday um, talkback. And we've had some difficult conversations, and I welcome them. Um, where uh, just last week, there was an audience member who said, this show infuriates me because this man is a legend and he's portrayed as an addict. He was an addict, but, he <laughs> um, but it's still like the kinds of images that are being put out there. We feel that the play interrogates that the way in which we're complicit in those images and that the value of telling this story of a man who is um, in, s in a large way forgotten you know, trump that, but we are really excited to have this conversation and to have audiences um, debate this issue after experiencing the show so that it's about the themes raised in the play and then tangentially about like the light and the set, <laughs> you know, all of those things. So it's a way that using the, the things that we're already doing, we're able to try to deepen those relationships and foster empathy and um, give people the tools to keep talking, um, to keep talking about the issues. Um, I'm just curious if, because I heard, because I heard I one of the actors that's in um, the current production at Calshakes oh yeah, is Ralphie. also in yeah. Grandeur. We're sharing. Yeah, well, and I, you know, I've been, I uh, have known about Gail Scott Heron for a while, but I'm just so interested in, you know, that he is such a public figure and is so important for like black culture in America. And I'm wondering how y'all are negotiating having, you know, a white director and an Asian playwright, right? The folks who, who are on the team ha defending this choice are not part of the community that like, for which this figure is so empowering. and. And of course, it would be so upsetting to see your idols, right, like um, portrayed in, in not the most like perfect, beautiful light. But yeah, I would be so curious to hear about that because that was when I researched that. I was like, who directed? Who wrote it? And then I was like, oh, you know, like how? Yeah. I, I think that's an important conversation to have too. And and we did have those conversations from the first moment he sent the script, and. Um, Loretta was like, you need to have a black director. And Han felt like he wanted Loretta to direct it. And we did a workshop in 2014 and kept having these conversations over years. Um, and that workshop had the same cast that we have now. So we've been having um, conversations within the cast. And I, I haven't been um, necessarily in those like 
rooms with those with those with Loretta and Han, and I was part of the rehearsal process. I was a dramaturg for the show, but um, only in the early stages and the early workshops. But these are conversations that we've had with every workshop. We did a workshop at Black Swan Lab at OSF, and you know, raise those questions for actors to respond to because um, it is a tricky, it's a tricky terrain and we just felt like the play needed to be produced and these were the people who were right for the, the project at this time. The, uh, it's about risks. I remember when you, were when you and I were talking, um, I think you defined the theater as 100% risk and um, uh, with risks come um, lots of responsibilities. And, it's and, and so it's about responsibility to take care of those conversations and, and the, the, di the dialogues. Can I add something though? Yeah. You know, um, this question has been discussed a lot, but actually the more charged issue has uh, seemed to me to be that our audience is largely white. And so it isn't uh, necessarily a safe space for the audience members of color, for the African American audience members, to experience this work. And that, has, that was an issue that was raised in our last staff meeting. So there is a lot of different sort of varying levels of um, danger <laughs> and risk. Mm. I just want to kind of jump into this idea of the portrayal of him accurately as an addict. And let's talk about the politics of addiction in America how we portray it and where we locate the responsibility for that. Because I know that I'm working in an area where there's an astronomical rate of opioid addiction and it probably doesn't need any more exposure, these stories of opioid addiction in Appalachia. Who's bringing those drugs into our community? All right, it's not the poor white people <laughs> you know, that we serve with our theater. That's not who brings the drugs. Who's bringing drugs into uh, economically struggling urban communities? It's not the people who live in those communities. Who's profiting from this? So, you know, that's something that I think it definitely behooves us to bring to the stage. And if, if we have idols, you know, who has exposed them to the possibility of addiction? Who is bringing the drugs into those communities? That opens up that conversational pathway. Mm. In terms of, so Amy, you're mentioning community. I want to get back, get to that theme of the conversation. What are the, for each of you, the um, issues that are percolating in your communities um, and ways that your theater is responding to them. And um, how do we take care of that garden? You know, is it, is it a, ma uh, a table, a communal table? Is it microfunding? Um, is it uh, talkbacks? What, what are the different ways that we're responding to the community in terms of curating this, the conversation that we're telling uh, and then ways of delivering that conversation. So anyone want to respond to that? Well, I could share a little story coming out of the, uh, the, the piece we did on World War I where the, uh, Rush Rem, who put together the selected the material for it, didn't just want your, your typical array of Wilfred Owen poems or maybe an Ernst Younger thing about trench warfare. We had some of that, but also a lot of pieces uh, from the point of view of women and what they experienced during the war both as uh, people out there caring for the horribly injured soldiers and so on. And so there were these gruesome long pieces um, about, about what modern warfare did to the human body. And in the course of the talkbacks, uh, Stanford has a fair number of military veterans in our community. And so some stories came out in the course of the, the talkback of people who had, had been through things like that, had seen things like that. And, and shared things like that. So it, it became this unlikely catalyst for this discussion in our community because we also have young people who are, I just had a student uh, just graduated and she's headed off to be a Marine officer. Uh, so some of them are going into uh, the military and there's some very, very inter interesting interchanges among folks sharing these experiences. But as you're dealing with these issues of war, how are you questioning uh, all the, the nexus of issues about war, military, are you, are you interrogating that or is it just a, 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 plat a platform 
for plays and how people interpret that or what people's how people question that is up to themselves. So far it seems to me we, we're leaving the interpretation as much as possible with the audience mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, curating it, curating it in such a way that it hands them a message, mm -hmm. a, a line that they stand on. Because um, that brings out a, a, a greater uh, diversity of backgrounds. When we did the play about the Iraqi translators, uh, we had this talk back, and uh, at Stanford we have the, the Hoover Institution, and you know about that, the, uh, the think tank, a very conservative, very right-wing think tank, and it's full of former military, former government people. And um, some of their perspectives um, about the futility of the Iraq war, they were willing, the, 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 the show, because it um, put it on this personal basis of um, the Iraqi translators, it opened up a space, evidently, for people who had initially supported the, the war in Iraq mm. to, to share some of their doubts about it, mm. but without being led there so much, it seems to me. Did you want to respond in terms of the community and the issues that are I'm rising? glad to hear, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear uh, the mentions of mass incarceration so far in the first panel, and I want to kind of continue that with a little bit of uh, apple shops and roadsides historical work there. So right before I had moved down about a year and a half ago and began work with roadside, um, I was living in Cincinnati. So I lived there briefly, and um, I moved down to southwest Virginia, and I realized that I had moved from uh, the site of the convictions of a disproportionate number of people of color I, I had moved from uh, the place where they were sentenced, where they were arrested and sentenced, down to basically what serves as a dumping ground for those people. Every day when I drive home from work, I look up the ridge and I see uh, Wallens Ridge Prison. And I didn't know what it was at first. I had to ask. I thought it was some kind of industrial park that was lighted at night, but then I realized it was a prison. And Appalachia is basically ground zero, particularly central Appalachia, ground zero for for-profit and federal prisons. Um, and this is where they ship these people who are convicted unduly, eight, nine, 12, 15 hours away from their families. It's where they are basically locked up and the key is thrown away and people don't have to look at these prisons or remember that the people are there. Um, so part of my education in moving to that area is finding out the historical work that these organizations have done to advocate for these prisoners and say, no, these are members of our community now and we're not gonna forget about them. Uh, there was a, a play that Roadside did um, several years ago called Thousand Kites. I don't know if anyone's heard about it, but uh, it takes a multiplicity of viewpoints. Uh, it's based on story circles and interviews that were conducted with inmates, inmates' families, uh, prison guards, and prison guards' families, so that the entire experience of daily life in these prisons is, uh, is um, kind of offered up in a confessional way. and multiple viewpoints are represented so that entire communities are able to see these plays and recognize themselves and their positions in them, which in turn opens up conversations afterwards that because it's not a single viewpoint, it allows people to engage with the material and um, basically it becomes a public forum for debate, the play. Um, we might have very strong opinions as the people who are creating these plays, but the idea is that by lifting up the first voices, the lived experiences of the people who are directly impacted by the problem, the people who are directly impacted by the problem become instrumental in solving that problem. Mm -hmm. So it's not documentary theater in the sense that it's, it's removed from the people on the ground and then portrayed maybe in you know, elite or wealthy institutions. Um, you know, it's happening right there. This play is presented in communities that are impacted by incarceration. And then people who are either incarcerated or whose families work for these prisons are able to give feedback on it and contribute directly to the creative process. And then we collaborate with other Apple Shop projects, like WMMT has a show called uh, Calls From Home that got a little bit of uh, media coverage recently. Um, and it's basically a request and dedication show so that uh, the families of people who uh, you know, have people in prison can send requests and dedications and then requests and dedications can be sent from the prisons and in this way the hip hop music that they dedicate uh, is communicating, you know, with their families in the way they'd have otherwise, you know, 
not have a way of reaching, and it keeps the prisoners and the families in the, the forefront of the, the residents' minds. They know that these people are living among us, they're in our community, and we're, we're reminding of that on a weekly basis, so. Mm. I guess people want to talk about the issues and the in your community and how your theater is responding to them. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, the word community is like so, mm. just like, you know, what does that actually mean? I feel like the identity communities that I'm a part of are like queer and trans people and specifically qu queer and trans people of color are like trying to live and just trying to survive and like, mm. you know, thrive right now. So like that that is just like a truth. Um, something that I, I don't know, I, I've been trying to like wrap, like connect to community. I don't know if this is Carmen's quote or it's someone else quote, but this idea that like, um, the arts need community and communities and communities need justice and like what is actually it look like for um, our theaters our organizations and us on an individual level to be pushing justice forward um, and I think it looks like a personal realm healing and really sort of figuring out where individual trauma is and why folks are holding on to power and space and is that connected mm. um, I think it's uh, a, a cultural level you know how our plays are actually interrupting kind of historically dominant narratives and really pushing that forward and who are the people making those <laughs> plays and who are we making them for you know um, so then also looking at structural level, right? Who is getting paid? Who's getting paid sustainably? Who has jobs in this? Who has power in this? Who is the audience? Who is the board made up of, you know? Who's in the room? Who's in the room? Who's on this panel right now? You know, it's like even this panel is like majority white people. And uh, that's not an attack on you, you know, curating. I'm also like here in place of Eric Ting, right? But like being able to have conversations about that and know that it's like this, that it's not, it's not helping put ju push justice forward, you know, to keep having spaces that are like dominated by whiteness and conversations that are dominated by whiteness. And to really work at decentering that and centering folks of color in our organizations and folks with, you know, lived experience of oppression, which is hard, right? Because a lot of the, uh, you know, racism that I perpetuate and uh, I experience also comes from like white women, you know, in queer and trans community, racism is a huge issue. Like these issues are intersectional. Like I just like love how much you're bringing up class and I just <laughs> wanna like affirm that big time, right? Because um, I don't know, that's also a big part of the picture too. Uh, I don't have like an answer or a tie to community, but I feel like that's just something I wanted to name if we keep focusing just on the art and the artistic process without simultaneously working on the individual spiritual level as well as structural mm -hmm. and knowing how we sit in all of those at once like nothing's gonna change right nothing's yeah. actually gonna change absolutely Do, may I jump in and kind of uh, bolster that idea uh, let's mm. let's talk a little bit more about community and then the institutions that serve community. Um, I want to introduce a couple of ideas. Uh, we, we organize from uh, an idea of Bayard Rustin's, which is that you need community centers of power. All right, and as our institutions have become subject, as we all are, as every structure that we are living under is subject to capitalism, I think there's been an increasing mistrust of institutions, um, a move away from them. But more than that, I mean, it is not coincidental that uh, our sensitive community and the way that we experience community, especially where I come from in Appalachia, are kind of degraded. That's not an accident. I think everything that we're seeing politically now is the, the visible tip of the iceberg. And what's below is about 40 or so years, probably more, of anti-community policy. All right, and we need to talk about that. In my region, it manifests as 150 years of us being um, an extractive mineral colony. That's what informs our community. That is a huge part of our identity. We are historically a site of traumatized people with colonial mindsets. And uh, I am here to insist because uh, a lot of the rhetoric right now 
it's very dangerous and uh, we are becoming more sectarian and there's this idea that we are disposable people. That Trump country is full of disposable people who must be bypassed um, in order to make any kind of social change. But as I become more familiar with these democratic organizing ideas and the history uh, of democratic labor organizing in Appalachia, I realize there's no bypassing. There's no getting around it, all right? If, if we want to dismantle white supremacy and other forms of domination in places like central Appalachia, there have to be cultural workers who are willing to dig down and have the uncomfortable conversations that you're talking about. Um, I recently visited Highlander Center in Tennessee, which if any of you have been there, uh, is a historical nonviolent uh, organizing and resistance site that was run by Miles Horton, who was an incredible <laughs> Appalachian man. And uh, I was reading his interview with Studs Terkel <laughs> in the archives there, and he said, oh yeah, man, Highlander Center was full of Klansmen. And Studs Terkel said, what? And I said, yeah. And we had Klansmen and uh, civil rights organizers working together every single day in this space to do democratic labor organizing. And uh, you know what? Those Klansmen might not have liked it. They complained to me. But when it came right down to it, they did the work that they needed to do alongside people of color and alongside socialists and communists <laughs> to do what they felt was best for their families and their communities. And they got results. So living where I live and um, helping lift up the work of the community organizers that I do, I guess I'm, I don't have a lot of patience for my fellow white liberals who say, oh, I just can't with those people in Trump country. I, I, I just can't. I can't be around their racism. Really? Who are you going to leave that work to? Uh, people of color who are living down there? I mean, if those people of color in the place where we come from can work alongside those people every day to make change and to organize our communities, you know, you're telling me your white ass can't have a civil conversation on Facebook? I get it. I'm mad too. I'm mad all the time. I'm mad at everyone on both sides because I straddle two worlds constantly. And I think we all do in one respect or another. Mm. Those of us who are uh, working under certain forms of privilege, those of us who are college educated, or maybe those of us who came down from the Northeast and don't understand how communities down in the South work. We're all mobile in ways that people maybe didn't used to be. So we're negotiating dual cultures. And I want to encourage us to keep digging in to that mm. plurality and the hard, gross, embarrassing conversations with people who are, yes, they're subject to white supremacist framework and they have ingested those ideas and it shows up in their conversations. Let's not be so fast to move past them. I'm gonna stop. Mm. I don't think I have anything to add to that, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not, let's just open it up. Leslie, she, uh, she, her, hers. I just want to say you're wonderfully so mentioning history. Please go deeper and mention the indigenous before that. We don't have re indigenous representation here that I know of and um, uh, that seems visible to us or has uh, introduced themselves, but we must bring them into the room. This is so critical. Thank you. Right. Other, other questions? Let's go. Let's open it up. Hi. Can you hear me? Uh, Amy and SK have both alluded to the question of labor conditions within the institutions that you work in. Amy, you spoke candidly about your pay, and SK, you talked about payment for emotional labor for people who you work with. Uh, I'm wondering if anyone on the panel uh, is able to discuss the question of labor conditions within the institutions and share ways in which you are addressing and talking about those questions. So we've talked uh, a great deal about the work, so the spaces of performance and the spaces of, of making performance. But I guess I'm interested in how the questions that you're raising, for example, in the process of making a performance, 
uh, are also being addressed amongst your co-workers as, a, as an organisation. Uh, how, what is the, the politics of labour within the organisations that you work in and how self-reflective are those organisations about those politics, those inequalities or debates? I can just say at Apple Shop, we have vistas, uh, but we pay our interns and our community participants. We pay them for their labor because people can't work for free there. It's a challenge. Um, we're in San Francisco, which is like the most expensive <laughs> city. Um, and it's, yeah, I, I don't feel like those conversations are being had enough because it's always like stretching thin and everyone is stretched thin. Um, so I don't, I, I just want to add that I think it should be happening, but in, I don't think it's happening enough, including in my organization. At Stanford, there's a pretty amazing range, right, of, of what people get paid and the kinds of work that people do. And the university, as you might imagine, is not terribly eager to be discussing this, uh, in that sense. What really drives it though, the students, they want to hear more about it. They want to talk about it a lot. And so they are always agitating us to be looking at uh, texts that might uh, offer a way to get people talking about that. The, the exception in the rule, the rec actually, uh, that was part of the whole ethics of wealth program that the, the Society and Ethics Center was doing. But the students are driving it. We look to the students. Thank you. Uh, such a good question. Thank you. I feel like, uh, you know, so much comes up for me with that, uh, you know, with talking about class. I, I'm in a producer role. This is the first time I've been in a role like this and started to see how much people get paid, how much actors get paid, how much designers get paid. Like, I, I feel like for me, I've, I have access to like this wealth of hidden information before. Um, so me, I don't know, maybe, uh, I, I can just like uh, give like more of a person, like not an institutional answer to that. And I'm struck by how new this information is, despite how many <laughs> theaters I've worked at. And you know, it's like nonprofit industrial complex shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like w it, that is like totally what that is, where we're expected to like feel grateful for the little that we have because the value of the work is compensating for the rest. Um, you know, I don't know. Yeah, that's that's kind of like what I can offer, right? I c it's like queer and trans, like service-oriented art making, you know, like f for in Chicago, we made stuff with like no money <laughs> at all and it was beautiful, right? So I'm in this moment a little bit where like I see the budgets here, at, at least at Calchix, and you know, the folks running them, at least for artistic engagements, are folks who have experience with community work, so like that money is getting spent and folks are getting paid for stuff like emotional labor, for stuff like, you know, um, the, the more minor role or the not as senior roles, I don't know, whatever. So I know that, I, I don't know, that's what I can share, but I, for, from my personal like motivation, I wanted, I wanted to know, like I wanted to know what, what the kind of bones were behind a lot of these companies. So it, it's really new for me. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm Amrita Ramanan, uh, she, her, hers. Uh, I often feel, you know, personally and then with, you know, the organizations I've worked for, uh, a lot of curiosity around accountability. And so I wanted to ask um, for whoever would like to answer, um, what are the ways in which you assess personal accountability in your work? Um, how does that then move to organizational accountability? And how do you translate accountability to action? Hi, Amrita. Hi, it's good to see you. Uh, so I had, I had to figure that out really early on because I came from a kind of a mainstream theater background. I was educated in the Northeast. I got my dramaturgy MFA and I'd only ever really worked in the sort of the lower nonprofit theater world and that was what I was comfortable with. And then I went to a frontline organization 
where this amazing organizing work was being done and all the art and the media that is done is produced through that lens. So I had to figure out really fast uh, how to locate myself within that work and how I could best serve the organization and the communities that we live among and serve. Um, so uh, early on, a coworker gave me an article to read that uh, has been sort of foundational for me, and it's Marshall Ganz's essay, What is Public Narrative? If you've never read it, I think that every dramaturg should read it. I think it's incredible. And uh, Marshall Ganz encourages us to ask uh, three questions and orient our work around them. And one is, what is the story of self or the story of me? You know, who am I? What privilege do I enjoy? Uh, what is my, where, where am I located in the work? And what are my proclivities and my skills and desires? What is the story of us? What structures or institutions or social circles am I beholden to? Am I part of? Who do I affiliate with? And then the third question is, what is the story of now? What is needful of the moment? And how am I best positioned to respond to the needs of the moment? And how can I do that as part of a, a communal action uh, rather than as um, just a gesture that lifts myself up? So recognizing that I am not one of these community organizers, I am not one of these amazing people who is kind of out there every single day among the people of Letcher County or uh, Wise County where I live. Uh, the, the truth is that I do spend a lot of time grant writing I mean, let's, I, I love the dramaturgical work and the, the play creation side of it. But honestly, uh, probably <laughs> when, when we got an NEA grant recently, I felt like a hunter who had brought home a hunk of meat and was able to throw it on the table. It's something at least I can do. I mean, if it, I can do stuff like this. I can talk up my organization publicly. I have no dignity. I don't care. I'll tap dance topless if I can raise money for these people doing this incredible work. And maybe I'm not out there in the community every single day being the person who does that organizing, but I can find those people who are doing that work. I can use my skills to lift up that work, and that's how I hold myself accountable. You know, that's um, at Cal Shakes, we have an EDI work group, and the project we're currently working on is creating a system um, for reporting microaggressions and sort of dealing with that. So I feel like that's one institutional kind of accountability thing being put into place. Uh, I agree on a personal level. I think it's about healing and about educating yourself where you hold privilege and where you don't because in the spaces where you do hold privilege, that's where you have influence and that's when you, when you can be working uh, or where you can u leverage that privilege to do the good work. And I, don't, I also just, it's like, how are we accountable to this planet right now and to each other, you know? It just feels like such a, such a big question in the air and like how, a how actually does theater fit into that? The I feel like this is something I think about a lot, but I do think there is a sense of like alignment that happens when you're like, when you're working in, in justice work, <laughs> you know, and you're working against oppression, like there is a like a, a clarity and a truth and a wisdom that comes from that. Um, and, I, and I think that's also connected to accountability. Good evening. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Lee and I'm a community organizer. I'm the guy that's in the trenches every day. I find it interesting that y'all are up there talking about community and about the non-inclusion of people of color. I find that interesting because of the fact that one, I believe as a community organizer building numerous coalitions over the last two years. I believe y'all don't have a clue that what you talk about and what your concerns are aren't our concerns. For instance, in the barrios and ghettos of this country, sorry, climate change ain't uh, you know, on the top of our list. Police brutality is. But we see these organizations raising thousands and millions of dollars for polar bears in the Antarctic, while our little children starve in the streets of Detroit. And you wonder why you can't relate to us. Did you ever think that that might be a problem? Recently on Facebook, 
We had two GoFundMe campaigns up for homeless people, homeless street vendors. We couldn't raise but $5 a week on that. But white people, white animal rights activists put two chickens up there, raised $6,000 in 20 minutes. So what we're saying to you as people and organizers of color, leaders within our communities, is examine your issues. What issues are you working on? If you're working on climate change, how does that relate to us in the streets with our children starving? Look at you when you're on nonprofits and these institutions. Look at the makeup of your board of directors. I look at this panel here, and I'm listening to a bunch of fairly bright individuals. And I wonder to myself, where is this Dr. Shakur? Out here in the streets of South Berkeley. I don't see any youth up here. Right down the street on Alcatraz is some of the most amazing youth out of YSA you'll ever see. People that are every day are in the struggles and in the trenches. So when you talk about community, be very clear about what you're talking to. And when you want us to come to the same table, you must set that table so it is welcoming to us and has items that we are interested in or that we can relate to. But do not continue to sit up there scratching your head and going, oh my God, we don't have any people of color here. Because the solution is very simple on how you rate to us and how your consciousness of your language and the makeup of your board and the things that you and your institutions are. The last thing is, I want to point out, most of the institutions I find that are dominated by white boards, I really don't have a problem with that. It's something I deal with every day. What I do have a problem with is a Stalinist, authoritarian, hierarchical organization that says one or two or a steering committee gets to decide for the rest of us the direction of the organization. We're not going for that because that's not the way the barrio and the ghetto run. Uh, just a quick question about um, the local artists, especially in the Bay Area. The Bay Area covers a lot of miles, and we're having a problem. We have actors who come from over an hour and a half to two hours to rehearsal um, because they can't afford to live in the Bay Area. I don't know how much longer I can afford to live in the Bay Area, and I'm on a senior level at my organization. Uh, what are you finding with your artists? Um, are they coming from two hours away? Uh, uh, I mean, Berkeley right now, there's a huge affordable um, housing crisis, um, as well as in San Francisco. I live in San Francisco. Um, so and I'm just curious to know what your artists are dealing with, uh, how I mean, in Orinda, I mean, that's even further away than Berkeley if people are coming from San Jose or, and they're coming out there. I mean, they're coming up from all over. So I'm just curious to know what, uh, how you guys feel at your institutions about your local artists and is there a concern that, you know, other people, they're gonna have to go and to move to Chicago or places that are more, maybe potentially more affordable where there's a thriving theater um, district? I mean, first, the, I just want to lift up what this person said. This is like what we have been talking about, right? Like a huge disconnect between the folks who have power and who are in these insular conversations and the, like what the reality of people's lived experience and folks like, you know, that's like classic nonprofit is like, you know, the community is over there and this like group of people we talk about and serve, but then inside the folks who get paid are in a very different, you know, yeah, have a lot of privilege and, you know, make these decisions that, like, who knows <laughs> if, like, folks even want that, right? Can like we just commit to keep returning to what we just heard, too, please, throughout the conference, so that that's not forgotten? We totally. cannot move too fast past that moment. That's all I want to say. Right, like, in youth work and in a lot of community work, right, you are successful if folks, like, are, um, uh, like kind of rise through the organization and the folks who receive the services are then actually running it. That is like the ideal kind of model. And I think that is something 
I don't know, that could be used in theater too. Um, in terms of transportation, I mean, I think I'm super interested in what you have to say because it feels like there's a huge call for folks who move to the city from the suburbs, you know, especially after the election to like go back <laughs> and stop gentrifying, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's like sort of, I, I'd be interested as someone who is like working in a rural area, like just thinking about the patterns of how people are gonna be moving around this world in the next like 10 years, like, I don't know, have those been conversations in your communities? You know, folks who are really fired up and are like, dang, I actually don't know if the city is for me. Maybe I need to actually go back to where my family lives and have those hard conversations there or whatever. I'm so curious, as someone who like grew up in cities my whole life, like I, I would love to hear your perspective or any anyone who has a perspective on that. I'll keep mine brief so that y'all can jump in, but uh, our artists and cultural workers, uh, we're in the midst of a big generational turnover at Apple Shop. So we have uh, people who were born and raised in Letcher County form the strong core of the organization because we feel that uh, Appalachian residents are the experts on their own culture and communities and should be empowered to do those things as often as possible, you know, without maybe intermedi intermediary organizations and think tanks and that uh, the art that they create and the media that they create should be lifted up. But two, there are those of us, uh, I guess you could call us, uh, Matt Fleurty at uh, Art of the Rural calls us the rural diaspora. <laughs> so, you know, we've, we've left. I'm Gen Xer, I left because I was told that was the only way I was gonna be able to make a living as an artist, was to leave Appalachia, so I did. And, uh, you know, after grad school, I made a conscious decision that I wanted to go back. I knew when I, when I read that chapter in Ideal Theater about uh, Roadside and Apple Shop that I wanted to go back. So, um, you go back and you're surrounded by people who never left. People who do drive an hour, two hours. Some of our participants uh, go incredibly far out of their way. We're talking about people who have no broadband or drinkable water, um, you know, are, are finding a way to get to the building every day or find a way to come over the mountain for rehearsals and, and work with us. So if you live in rural America, just transportation, mobility is a huge issue. That kind of infrastructure, we always have to be thinking in terms of how we can even get people to come. And then who's willing to move back to rural? I mean, the out-migration is overwhelming. People are disinvesting more and more in rural America, and, and that's, that's uh, reflected on a national policy level. So. I mean, all I can say personally is I'm not willing to uh, become sectarian about it or sever ties with urban America because this idea was put forth in the first panel that we are interconnected. There is no future for America without urban and rural interconnection and that should begin and end with artists driving that. I was just gonna state the obvious of my experience which is affirming what you've said, that people are leaving. Um, the young people that we have a, an apprenticeship program every year, we train um, young future theater leaders and they 90% of the time return, like three of them are moving to Chicago. Maybe <laughs> I should have them talk to you. And one's going back to Philadelphia, which is where her family is. And it's just not really sustainable for someone just starting out. I'm having a hard, you know, we, we, I'm trying to stay in the city and raise my daughter in the city and it's just like, it's just bad, and I don't have a solution. I just wanted to just. Hi, I just, I got here a little late, so apologies if you covered this dirty, but I wonder if any of you um, in your work with your organization um, are in communication with government about policy around this housing stuff? I know like, uh, so I'm from Seattle, uh, and we are having conversations all the time, looking at the Bay Area and being like, oh, we could be like that if we don't get Amazon under control. Um, and a lot of that starts with policy conversations. So I wonder if any of you could speak to uh, some of the work you've done with that regard. Unless you did already and I missed it. Fun fact, uh, we lost our core performance ensemble around 1997, so. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, so we do do a lot of policy work because that's a, a big part of what we contribute now. Uh, so we do a lot of writing, a lot of uh, publication, and a lot of uh, 
communicating with government officials to try to change this policy. We work with nonprofit organizations who advocate for rural America and look to connect uh, low-income communities across the U.S., including both r urban and rural. Yeah. I feel like in this post-Trump world, we're all sort of being pushed into some of a position of more advocacy than we've ever been more comfortable with. So, um, and may not be fully equipped to to do that in the most effective ways. But like, we're sending letters about support the NEA and making calls to representatives. But um, yeah, it's a new ground. I just want to um, thank all the panelists, and maybe before we close, if each one of you can just put out one provocation to the field, one statement, one provocation, which many we, many of them have already been mentioned. Maybe it's a re reiteration of what you've already said, but just throw that bomb out there. I feel like the provocation was made by that gentleman about the value of what we're doing relative to people starving in the street or even you know we've had we've had people call um, I've heard overheard conversations where some of our donors are saying we can't donate to you as much or at all this year because these other things are pressing on us more fully so I think that is like the field wide pro <laughs> provocation that we need to be thinking about what are we bringing to people and how and I do feel that we are bringing something or we wouldn't be here but how do we convey what the value is for people's lives um, in a really tangible way? I'm going to quote a couple of figures. I'm, I'm a note reader and a note taker, so uh, I want to leave with some figures and statistics and continuing the trend of quoting Jeff Chang because he cannot be quoted enough. I love him. And I'm also going to quote uh, a philanthropy researcher, Holly Sigford. I don't know if anyone's been reading her reports yet. Uh, she has a new one out. Uh, so, despite growing numbers of nonprofit cultural groups focused on serving people of color, low income communities, LGBTQ institutions, and the disabled, nearly 60% of arts funding goes to just 925 of the largest institutions whose audiences are predominantly white and upper income. The percent of all gifts, grants, and contributions that flows to institutions with annual budgets of 5 million or over has increased and the percent going to groups with budgets under one million has declined. So understand there that we're talking about a lot of frontline and cultural equity organizations there. So Jeff Chang says, of every foundation dollar, 11 cents goes to the arts. So right there, there's inequity. 5.5 cents of that 11 cents goes to art organizations with budgets of more than five million who make up just 2% of all arts organizations. And his conclusion is that, objectively, inequality in the arts nonprofit funding world is worse than income inequality in the US. So we look at these institutions serving comparatively few wealthy, privileged white people receiving greater and greater amounts of funding and organizations that serve broader bases and more diverse bases, the people that we hope to address in this conference are getting less and less funding. And I hope that we'll continue to talk about that. Thomas and Aztec. Uh, Brecht said that theater is a luxury. And I don't know if, if that is a trap for us or if we should be thinking about is this a luxury to which everyone has a right to have that space to think and to feel and to experience something. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, yeah, I think this was me. Uh, Mina said that this was mentioned in the first panel, but right, the uh, artistic director positions at three major theaters in the Bay are switching over like right now. So uh, I, I think there's the assumption I had when I first came on was that this would be a situation um, which is
Uh, <laughs> just saying that the three, there are three huge theaters in the Bay that are switching artistic directorship in the next like year and a half to three years. And um, a lot of organizing, going around those choices and getting folks in, in, in leadership at those positions, I think who have ex multiple experiences of like lived depression, right? That like really impacts like the art that is made. Um, but with, with that organizing, I think all of us in the Bay Area need to think about the uh, theaters that ha are culturally specific and have been doing this work for quite some time and how we can strate strategize to lift up those theaters as well so that they don't suffer if a bunch of these large theaters uh, start sort of pulling resources, right? Yeah. Excellent. I want to uh, thank the panelists, Amy, Sonia, Thomas, and SK, and thank all of you for your uh, engagement and your involvement, and uh, let the hard questions uh, um, continue throughout the conference. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, so let's uh, gather together. If you can help um, bring the people out of Osher, A, B, and C, please, everyone, gather together.